Okay, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is on capturing consumer demand for local food. Cultivating Success that is hosting this webinar and our winter webinar series is a partnership of University of Idaho Extension, the nonprofit organization Rural Roots, and Washington State University's Food Systems Program. I'm Colette De Phelps, and I'll be your presenter today. I'm an area educator in community food systems, and I serve primarily northern Idaho, though I do have some statewide responsibilities, and I'm located on the Moscow campus. Mackenzie Lawrence, who's our administrative coordinator for community food systems and small farms, is also here on the Moscow campus, and she's going to be the facilitating today and moderating the questions and the chat. So just some reminders, if you're new to webinars or if you haven't been on one for a while, it can be helpful to close the other programs running on your computer so that your internet bandwidth can be devoted to speed and sound. If you are having problems with the sound, you can call in at any time. The phone number for this webinar is in your welcome email. If you do call in, please mute your computer so you can avoid getting feedback. At any time during the presentation, you can type in questions for me or, or for help with viewing the sound or with viewing uh, the speed of the presentation or your sound. So you can type those into the question box and Mackenzie can help you with those. Um, if you have a burning question and it's related to a specific part of my presentation, because I'll be will be showing you a lot of data today, then um, Mackenzie will jump in and ask me that question while we're looking at that particular slide. We'll also have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, handouts and a recording of this webinar will be available from the Cultivating Success website. I also emailed you all a copy of today's webinar slides so they're in your email inbox and you don't need to um, try to write down any of that detailed information. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into our webinar. So I have four main topics I'm going to be talking about today in this whole area of consumer demand for local food. So one, I'm going to show you some of the information we have that demonstrates that we do have consumer demand for local food. Then I'm going to talk about the importance of you identifying your customer because as you'll see in the demand information, all customers are not the same. And then we'll talk about creating and targeting your message that are focused on your ideal customer and then what some next steps and resources are that you can use as you move forward with your farm marketing. So as I mentioned, with local food, we know that consumer demand exists. And increasingly, we've been doing research to understand what consumers want and what they need. And as a producer, you really need to understand what consumers want and need so that you can find who your customer is. So when you think about your customer, you really need to think about whose needs can you meet and can you make it an easy choice for them to purchase from you. And overall, what we really know is that in the realm of local food, being authentic and transparent regarding what you produce and how you produce is really important to your customer. So when we think about knowing your customer, we think about some things that are really important. One is what are the things that they value that is driving their local purchasing? Another thing is what are their needs that affect local purchasing? So when we think about values, they may value um, freshness and taste or quality, or perhaps it's really important to them to support their local farmers. But what they need could be different from what they value. So they need a product that fits within their overall food budget, or they need a project if they're a restaurant that fits within their menu or the flexibility of their menu, or they might need a certain quantity of a product if they're doing home canning, or a certain quantity of a product if they have a signature item on their menu that they always need to have that in order to satisfy the restaurant's customers. Some of the best practices for selling into, the, into you, to your specific customer um, really depend on what their values 
and needs are and to what degree you can meet them. And to know those things, you need to research and assess your market. When we talk about researching your market, there's primary data and there's secondary data. Primary data is the data that you collect yourself. So this is when you go out and you identify what the values, interests, and needs are of your market. You might do that through uh, contacting people by phone, uh, visiting different farmers markets. You might do a survey if you're going to uh, like local retail or restaurants. It's how you collect information about about the people that you think might be interested in your product, so your market. We also identify in that primary data researching direct markets, which are sales direct to consumers. So that happens at the farmer's market, perhaps a farm stand, online through your website, or through a community-supported agriculture weekly subscription project. Then there's intermediated sales, which are sales that are direct to retail, restaurants or maybe a dis local distributor or institution like a school. So secondary data is research that's already been collected and that research you really want to look at because it informs how you will do your primary research. It doesn't replace primary research. So what I'm going to show you today is secondary data and then talk a little bit about how you can use that data to think about who your customer is and what conversations you need to have with them to identify what their values and needs are. So one of the organizations that has been really looking at this whole arena of buying local for over 30 years is the Hartman Group. And you can find a lot of really interesting reports and podcasts on their website. So one of the things that they do is they really look at the organic and natural realm and, of course, within that, the local products. So they developed a report in 2018 that said that 39% of consumers reported buying more food products than they did a year ago. So this data is looking at surveys in 2017. So you can see that, you know, 39%, that's a lot of increase of consumers at least buying some local products. But why do they do that? Well, for a lot of people, they really want to know their product in more depth. So they look for products made by companies that they consider open and honest. They look for things that are made in their community or the region. They look for products where they can really learn about the origins and how it's produced. And what they say is that buying local is important because there's some environmental benefits, which they think are things that are for the greater good, like reducing pollution from transporting products or supporting local families and businesses that are part of the community. Those are greater good drivers. But some of the personal drivers for folks is that they really experience a product that they see as different from something that they can get from um, a product that is produced farther away. So foods that are fresher and seasonal and perhaps even more nutritious and they really find it important to know the producer. They like to be able to talk to people who have grown their food or have made that into a processed product. Another report that came from Hartman was looking at health and wellness and sustainability. And they talk about consumers at the core and consumers at the periphery. So when we talk about core consumers, and in this particular presentation, we're talking about core consumers being one that are really committed to buying local. And they're the, really the people at the center of the bullseye. So this is, you know, we're looking at 10 to 15 percent of customers that are identifying as local, and we might say that they're hardcore. So they're really looking at decreasing food miles, environmental benefits like shrinking their carbon footprints, and they're important of things that we call fair trade such as workers rights. As we move out to the periphery of this this bullet, we look at some of the characteristics characteristics that consumers that maybe are not as diehard about local, but local is important to them and we ask them why why are you doing this? So you're shopping local 
less for less of your products, but it's still important to you. And one thing is that they're really looking at the local economy and the environment, but even more important, they see that protect the local economy in the environment is protecting oneself and one's family. And so it's very, very personal in terms of their choices. So the reasons consumers are choosing to buy local are diverse. And because they're diverse, your messaging matters. So ultimately, when you identify who your customer is, you'll need to know that customer well enough to understand what their needs and their values are. And so you can talk about how the product you have meets those needs and those values. One of the ways that we have really been able to see this growth of demand for local is in the growth of farmers markets. And in this slide at the top under why farmers markets, you can see that in 2000, across the US, we had about 2,800, 2,800 farmers markets. But in 2019, less than 10 years later, that is already up to over 8,768 markets. And this is the number of markets in the USDA farmers market directory. And we know that there are quite a few markets that aren't in there. People love going to farmers market because of the experience, but also because some of those other things that they value can be found at the farmer's market. So if they're committed to their local economy, they believe that shopping at the farmer's market supports lo local economy by recycling dollars within the community, that it also supports local farmers. They have an opportunity to talk to farmers or see the signage or information farmers put out to understand how and where their products are grown. We also validate a lot of these general ideas within Idaho by doing research at farmers markets called rapid market assessments. And oftentimes when we do an assessment, we ask what people's primary reason was for coming to the farmers market. And the number one reason in every assessment that we have done is to buy agricultural products. So I talked about some of the direct marketing motivations and values. So those are those consumers I just talked about, the individuals. Now I'm going to switch and talk about intermediated markets. So those markets that producers are selling to, it's direct to retail or direct to restaurants. So in 2016, we did a pretty comprehensive survey of all the buyers that we could find across Idaho that were identifying as having interest in local food. So we ended up receiving uh, return surveys from about 67 buyers. And we also surveyed producers and we had about 73 respondents. And so we were really looking at what are the opportunities and constraints for producers to sell direct to retail and restaurants. So when we got our data back, we realized that about half of our responses were from the counties that you see that are blue in this map. And these are counties that have pretty strong local food scenes, which by that we're saying there's a pretty strong farmer's market. There's at least some co-ops or natural food stores that have locally sourced products available. And there's a number of restaurants that are identifying as farm to table. And then in these other communities that have less visible local food scenes, we saw that we also had about half of our responses. So we thought it would be really interested to see if we saw any differences between the responses of those groups. And that's what I'm going to show you next. So one of the things that we also looked at is that, you know, we had about uh, for each of our visible, which which is the burgundy in this slide and less visible, which is the gray, we had an equal number of restaurants that responded from those two county types. Uh, in the visible counties, we did hear more from non-conventional retail, which we have identified as co-ops and natural food store, and a bit more from conventional retail in the less visible counties. But overall, in terms of our survey respondents, 97% of the respondents in the visible counties had sourced local food products in 2014 and 
53% in the less visible counties had sourced local products. So from that, we're really hearing primarily from buyers who are trying to source local. And that means that when they're talking to us about what their motivations are and what their challenges are, those are from experience. So overall, a high percentage of both count buyers in both county types really wanted to increase the quantity of local products that they sourced. 94% in visible counties, 92% in less visible. And it was still really high when we wanted to the number of people who wanted to increase the variety of local products they sourced. So you can see 94% visible counties and about 85% in less visible counties. So there was a lot of interest in increasing purchasing. So we really wanted to know, well, what motivates you? So this is where we get into the values. So what were the top four motivations for them to buy local food products? So across the board, was supporting local producers was number one. It was really important to these folks. Uh, when we looked at quality, quality was more important in those communities with a high, more highly visible local food scene. You see that that's 94% with about 60 percent in the less visible counties, but that's still important. We're almost 70% in those less visible counties. Both buyer types really wanted to support the local economy, and they saw a connection between buying local food products and supporting their local economy. And then we see that flavor is important, but flavor is actually more important in those uh, counties that have this higher local visible food scene and that's overall so these are trends this is secondary data so it's based on who we heard of but this kind of gives you an idea of what people might be valuing and looking for when we looked at some additional motivations you know differentiating their business in their community that was a pretty strong motivator but if you look at uniqueness this is something to consider depending on where you are and what your market is, uniqueness was much more important to those buyers that were in those highly visible food scenes, much less in those that had less visible food scenes. So if you're a producer and you're doing a lot of maybe exotic varieties of things, that might not be what your market wants if you are in a community that is maybe more rural or has a less developed local food scene. So you might really want to think about what you're buying and whether it meets the needs and interests of your market. Regardless of the county type, consumer demand was a big motivator. So again, going back to that individual demand, what these buyers are saying is that their customers are also looking for local. It wasn't the biggest driver that they had, but it was a significant dri driver. And then we also see that variety is not necessarily what they're looking for. Maybe they're looking for just a few items that they can have in enough quantity to meet their demand. We also asked about the importance of select characteristics to these buyers. This particular slide is showing you a combination of both those less visible and more visible local food scenes. So all of our respondents are here. So antibiotic free in terms of meat was pretty important to folks. So the large bands of lighter blue, that's very important and the gray is somewhat important. So they are attributing, you know, up to 78% of the buyers are saying antibiotic free is important. Um, Non-GMO, significantly important. That's very important to a lot of the, the buyers. Pesticide-free, that's some of the type of labeling or language that's often found in local food, which generally means not using synthetic pesticides. And so, again, really high. Over 76% of people were looking for pesticide-free. Free range is another term that people understand and was important, and humane animal treatment. There were even quite a few people that were looking for grass-fed in terms of their livestock purchases. And what we found really interesting is that certified organic for most of the, the buyers that responded to our survey was not their highest priority. While some, you know, not, about 9% said it was very important, another 51% said it was somewhat important. And I think this is important for you 
as producers because you may decide that, you know, there may be a cost benefit for certified organic because it is more expensive to do that. And it might be that if you are using organic practices, clearly defining how you're doing that and conveying it to your audience may meet what they need and what they value in terms of production practices for local food. We defined in our, in our survey that we did locally grown as within 100 miles and regionally grown between 100 to 400 miles. And what we found in both county types is that there was quite a high interest in both. So if you look, there's not too much difference between the demand for locally grown and regionally grown. They were both really important or somewhat important. And this is really good news for you. If your market is not within your community, your ideal customer your, is not within your community, that there could still be a regional customer for you that would value that source identity of your product. Another indicator of, you know, consumer demand for local is this local VOR index. And so this comes out every year. It's done by uh, this organization, Strolling of the Heifers. And I put the website here so you can check it out. And so what you can see from their accounting of local VOR, which is the people that are really in, you know, really, really interested more on the core the stronger commitment to local, that in 2018, Idaho ranked pretty high nationally. We were 12th. Washington State was 11th. The 2019 rank, we actually went up by five positions to be ranked seven nationwide, and Washington went up to be ranked four. So what's really interesting is that because the U.S. Ag Census is collecting different data, they were actually able to base their 2019 information on census data. So let's take a closer look at what they found in the census for Idaho. So Idaho's population is a little bit over 1.7 million people. So According to the census, farmers said that the value of food that they sold directly to consumers was about 28 million statewide, which if we look at a per capita sales, that's about $15.96. And then they said the value of ag products that they sold to those intermediated markets, retail, institutions, that might be a hospital, it might be a school, or food hubs, which are distributors that then pass that food on to a consumer, largely these intermediated markets, we're up over 85 million. And so per capita, that's $48.77 for a total of 64.73. Now, per person. So of course, we know that some of these people are more on the core, so they're actually having higher sales, they're buying more. And then we have some people that are more on the periphery. So what they're buying per capita is actually a little less. But it's really interesting to see when you look at the population and the value of food sold direct to consumers and to intermediated markets that Idaho is number seven nationwide. We do have a strong consumer demand. It's also really interesting to see that people are buying more local food through those intermediated markets. And what we also see in the census data is that farms that utilize both direct markets and intermediated markets are generally the most profitable and stable businesses. And again, this is on census data. So this is the National Ag Census. So oftentimes farmers start within these direct to consumer markets, but many then also look at moving into these retail markets or restaurant markets as a really strong um, opportunity for them to have more customers. So as I mentioned earlier, not everyone is your customer. And it's really your job to figure who is your customer. And that's that unique person or group of people that you want to target selling your products to. So if you are really committed to um, meeting 
the needs of your local community and you want to have your product be be more available to a wider range of people, then the price point is going to matter because different customers can pay different amounts of money. And if you're wanting to broaden that, you might want to work with your farmer's market or your grocery stores and really think about what, what are some of the programs could, that could really help increase the buying power of those customers. So we are seeing that EBT, which is the electronic benefits transfer for food stamps that's in many more markets where people can come to market and they can get tokens off of their EBT card to actually buy directly from farmers. You could be one of those farmers. There's also programs through the Idaho State Farmers Market Association where your market can get involved to do a double up bucks pro program that then people who are using that EBT benefit at market can actually have that a certain amount of money added for free every time they use their card to spend on food products at the market. So who is your customer? That's something that you need to define and then you need to figure out what the values and needs are for that particular customer. You also need to think about who are your competitors. And you know, increasingly we are seeing on the shelf at markets that big distributors in our state, Food Services of America, Spokane's Produce, Grasmic, Charlie's, they're starting to do more and more source identified product. And so they are able to put more of a geographic stamp on that, but less of a farm story. And so really what people are looking for in terms of connection is your farm story and understanding who you are. And that story is something that is unique to you. And really, your other small farmers are, are less about your competition and more about your collaboration. So if you think about a farmer's market, to get enough customers at your booth at the market, you really need to have a diversity of producers and more like consistent producers at market so that customers find that valuable to come to the market. So in that situation, your Fellow producers are actually collaborators that are helping you build a stronger market and a larger customer base. In this local food arena, as a small farmer, you really cannot compete on price. And that's why it's important to really be looking at the possibilities of working with your community to develop products that are more accessible to lower income individuals and households. And like I mentioned, the EBT at the market, double up bucks. There's also some farm to food bank programs that are in existence. There are some ways that you can really help supplement um, the, the access and ability for people to um, have access to local. However, what we see is that your price really has to be based on a fair return on your investment. And at a smaller scale, that is really, really difficult, those price points. And so you really need to know what you need to make to be profitable to set those prices and then be able to target your market. So your uniqueness is really the key to your profitability. And that's something that can't be competed away. Your farm story is your story. Your connection and relationship with your customers is unique to you. And that's a really huge asset that you have as a local producer. In thinking about your product, you really need to develop a real clear definition of your product that describes why is it unique and why would somebody want to have that product. So what are its special features and that could be could be your variety or it could be the taste and could be the freshness, the shelf life, or if you have a service associated with that product, maybe a delivery service or you have um, a guarantee in terms of the quality of your product and no questions money back guarantee you need to really identify what those things are so that you can create a nice definition and be able to share that with your potential customer and really be able to articulate to them in a small encapsulated statement or conversation what it, 
what's the benefit to them of buying that product? So when you're really clear about what your, your product is, you really need to also be clear about who your target market is. And so it will be important for you to identify who your customer is, whether that's a group of individuals, a restaurant, retailer, institution, and what type of restaurant or retailer is it? So if you're thinking about going into perhaps, you know, there's a really popular hamburger joint in your store, I mean, in your town, and you really want to sell to them, you're going to want to think about, well, what is it that they want? They might not want you know, a really unique heirloom tomato, but they might want a really nice, red, flavorful, juicy, you know, beefsteak tomato that is a pretty good size to fit on their burgers. So you would want to know if you could produce that and if you could produce it in the quantity that they would need to be able to buy from you and at a price point that they could buy from you. There might be very specific things that they would be able to elevate on their menu that would be local, that would be important to them and their customers, but there might be other things that just don't fit within their price point. So that's what you have to find out by having a conversation with those folks. We do know that quality and quantity are some of the key things for both uh, your your local market and your retail or restaurant, your intermediated market. So if you think about that, you know, if you're selling direct to your consumer, quality is definitely important to them. They're paying a higher price and they're expecting a product that is really high quality, that has been produced safely, and it could really benefit you to have a food safety plan and to elevate that with your customers. Um, Things like 100% money back guarantee, no questions asked, that can be really important. That conveys your confidence in, in your product. And then learning about the minimum and maximum quantities your market needs. This is super important in an intermediated market because there might be some things that they can be more flexible about in terms of the amount of product that they could use, let's say in a special, a seasonal special that they're doing versus a staple item on their menu. So staple items, they're really gonna need to be able to count that every time they need to order that, it's available for them. But there might be something that they're more flexible with. So you need to understand what it is that you can produce, how much, and then be able to convey that to your market. And regardless of your market, being reliable, consistent, and offering convenience is really important. We know that you don't want to promise what you can't deliver. And so sometimes that's why people do start in direct markets because they can really dial in on their production systems, figure out what really grows well for them, they can um, have some more flexibility if a crop doesn't work out. And then once they've figured out what they can grow really well and produce in quantity, they can approach a re restaurant or retailer with some very uh, clear understanding of what it is that they might provide to that market that actually generally needs more product or is used to the convenience of ordering every week off a fresh sheet from a distributor. And so developing those relationships, asking the customer what works best for them is really important. And then, you know, a bonus is whether you're at your farmer's market or at taking your product into an intermediated market, you want to provide samples or think about doing bonus items, something that keeps you on their radar. And as part of that, if you're working with an intermediated market, you really under need to understand how those folks want you to communicate with them. And what we found in our research is that that is not consistent across the board. Some chefs or buyers, they like te text messages. Others want a phone call. Others want a fresh sheet with a follow-up phone call. Others like to go online and order through an online system. It's really variable. And so that's where you need to identify who your potential customer is and go have a conversation with them, see what would work best for them. And when you're having that conversation, 
bring a sample of your product. One of the things that we've also found is that oftentimes people are looking for a market at the last minute and that's really, really tough. When I get a call and somebody says, I have two tons of cherries that are ready to be harvested and I need a market today, it's really hard for me to help them find a market in that short time period because they have a product that is fresh, beautifully ripened on the tree, and it needs to actually be picked and consumed in a shorter window than something that is picked when it's not ripe and travels and has a bit more of a shelf-stable life. So as much as you can, this is the time of year to get out there and talk to your potential buyers. If you are planting, you want to plant for your market. If you have livestock, poultry, eggs, you really want to think about where you're going to sell that and how much you really can produce and sell each year. And then if you're going to move into one of these larger intermediated markets, um, being able to con contact them before they plant so you understand the quantity and variety that they need is really important and how they want that packaged, how they need it delivered, the frequency of that. So for timing your plantings. And then if you do have a perennial crop like fruit trees or berries, that is something that you really need to find the market for and that window and delivery schedule before it's time to harvest. So what producers tell us is that, or I mean not producers, but buyers are telling us is that really increasing intermediated sales, it really is about looking at how can you grow the quantity and sometimes but not always the variety of products that you have, but really maintaining quality being reliable, so if you commit to, to be providing a product, that that product is something that shows up at their door. And I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about commitment to buyer's profitability, but that is important, as is convenience and consistency. So I want to talk a little bit more about committing to restaurant and retailers and institutions profitability. Their margins are actually really slim as businesses and they can't afford to pay retail prices. And generally speaking, what they're doing when they're producing or when they're purchasing a local product is they are paying that local producer more than they would be paying if they were buying from a distributor. So that wholesale price is higher, but it can't be the retail price that somebody gets at the farmer's market. And so that's just something that is a reality of selling to somebody who's going to be then taking that product and doing value added to sell it to somebody else. Their customers who, if you want to think about it in that way, are ultimately your customers as well. They are price and quality sensitive. And we remember we talked about poor shoppers. Only about 13% of those restaurant and grocery shoppers are those core shoppers. Most of the others are mid-level to the periphery. So thinking about that, this kind of explains why when you go into a restaurant or grocery store, they are very price sensitive and they might not buy as much as you would like them to to buy or they or they might buy, not buy the variety of things that you have. So again, dialing in on what it is that can make the most difference to them and their customers before you plant, before you harvest is very important. If you have opportunities to create value chains where everyone receives a fair return on their investment, that's a win-win for everyone. And it really is a sharing of profits. It's something that we're talking about more and more within local food and local food systems. And within this, there's a commitment to the relationship. And that is a commitment that if you develop these partnerships and you set prices that you agree on, that you'll stick to that relationship even if you have an opportunity to make more money by moving out of that relationship. And you know, this could be an annual commitment or a seasonal commitment, but maintaining that relationship is key to maintaining that market. So if there's an instance where somebody 
created a market relationship and one of those sides broke their commitment to either sell or buy, then that is a whole breakdown of the chain. So developing relationships, being sure about what you can commit to and following through on those commitments is extremely important in being successful in intermediated markets. I just wanted to say that, you know, you know, marketing local food, it's not just about fruit and vegetables. It's not only about livestock, eggs, poultry. Our dryland crops, our grains, our pulses, these are becoming more and more important parts of our local food culture. And we see more opportunities for people to grow grains, to grow beans, thinking about dried beans and the, and the like, and to move those into the market, both the direct to consumer market and the intermediated market. And so those grains, they also have a story. We also see that on the western side of Washington, in Western Oregon, many small producers are using grains as a rotational crop and then are finding some very niche markets with bakers or brewers or distillers for those grains. So it's something that you might think about if you have enough land is can you incorporate grains or dry bean production, something that's novel like that, but very shelf stable and marketable in the winter into your crop rotation, into your product mix. So one of the questions that you'll need to ask yourself when you're thinking about an intermediated market and really a direct to consumer market is, can you address the challenges that they would have to access local product? And when we did our research, we found that 95% of the buyers of local products said that some of the products that they wanted weren't even available. So there's an opportunity to have conversations about what are the specific products that are of most importance to your local buyers. And again, we found that there was a vast diversity of what people wanted. There were, we can't say that everybody wants tomatoes or everybody wants chickpeas or everybody wants beef. There was such diversity among the buyers that that's part of the conversation you need to have with your potential buyer. It's also important to understand when they need those products because a large number say it's hard to access products when they need them, the variety of what they need, and again, the price. And that's, that's a really important transparent conversation for you to have. And the more you understand your cost of production and what you need to make on each unit of your product to have a clear return on that investment, the more basis you have for that conversation about the price with those people who value your product, that they value you as a local farmer, they value supporting the community, they value the attributes of your product. But lots of times they don't understand how much it actually costs to produce that product and for you to have a living wage. So if you can convey that by having that information, that's going to help them understand and perhaps be able to shift a little bit and think about they, how they can look at their purchases to make room for that higher price for your product. Distribution is an issue. It, it can be expensive to bring your product to market. And so where are the opportunities for you to collaborate with other growers or to make more efficiency within your own regional distribution. So those are some logistics that you're gonna to wanna to map out and opportunities that you might want to explore. And then quantity, as I said many times in this presentation, that's really key for these restaurants and retailers. Sometimes they just have to have a certain amount of product to meet their customers' needs. So that's something to understand up front and if you can't produce that quantity maybe that's another opportunity for partnering with other producers in your area to be able to pull together the quantity that is needed by one of these larger markets. So what are your possible next steps? One is that you can conduct some of your own market research. I've given you a lot of background and you have these slides about some of that secondary research that's been done, but you really need to go out and identify who your potential customers are and do your own market research. 
you need to analyze and know your price point. So again, what is the price you need to get a fair return on your investment in your product? Building those relationships, learning from other growers, building relationships with your customers, and even just really um, doing some scouting and kind of see how people are marketing things in your community. Um, what are some of the values that are really strong in the markets that you're looking at and how can you meet those values? And then, as I mentioned before, make sure that you're growing for your market. As much of your product as you know where it's going to go and how it's going to be sold or have a contract for before you plant it or before you raise it, that is going to really benefit you because those last minute market um, access, last minute market access is just really hard. Here's some resources that can really help you with the market assessment and business planning. I'm showing you two that are available online. So Farming Alternatives, this is a great book that has a lot of worksheets and it's available for free. It has a lot of worksheets about how to assess your market and develop that message about your product. Um, Fearless Farm Finances is a great book that is not available for free. It is a good investment. And the Organic Farmer's Business Handbook is one that has a companion CD that has a lot of spreadsheets that you can use to be able to um, just put information in and understand what your costs of production are and help you get that, get that down to a unit price. Building a Sustainable Business is a really good resource, again, with a lot of worksheets. It was produced by the USDA Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, and it is defined, designed for farmers. A lot of worksheets, if you like to kind of go through a step-by-step -step process of understanding about how to build your business, that's a really good free resource for you. A couple of great marketing resources are available from familyfarm.org. They have two pretty substantial publications. Um, they are not inexpensive. They're about $80 each and they really are work, worth it. One focuses specifically on wholesale markets and another on direct markets. They talk about everything from uh, post-harvest handling, how to maintain quality in that cold chain, to food safety, how to pack and grade for different markets. They, in the back, have a list of um, like one page sheets on all different kinds of crops for the best handling and storage options for those. So to really dial in on some of those pieces about quality, these are really good, good resources. And again, they are great to help you think about how to work with those intermediated buyers and those direct markets. Entering into these different markets has a lot of uh, legal issues, and those are things that you're going to want to be up to date on. Farm Commons is an organization that has a lot of free resources. It's specifically designed for people who are involved in sustainable agriculture and selling direct to consumers and intermediated markets. They both have videos and print materials, as you'll see, that many, many free resources. They cover things like, what does a good contract look like? So if you are selling to a grocery store, what do you need to think about in contracts? And even um, how a verbal contract is a contract under the law. Liability insurance, definitely something that you need and that some markets will require. Uh, how, how do you form a business entity that is going to protect your farm assets and your personal assets? Great resources on that. Again, a lot of information about food safety, how to think about risk management around food safety, which is on people's minds more and more. And then if you have labor on your farm, what are some of the rules about labor and how can you find out more information? So in summary, I just really want to say that some of the things that are really important to consumers are transparency and authenticity. And as a local producer, those are some of your strengths. You have an opportunity to build 
relationships with your customer and to share information about how you produce your product, the quality, the special attributes of that product, and your farm story. Those are some of the unique things that you bring to market. They're some of your greatest assets. You also have to think, though, about how to be convenient and affordable. Outside of those core shoppers that are not as price sensitive and will really go out of their way to find local food, most people are looking for ways to incorporate local food into their existing buying habits or maybe taking on one a new habit like going to market or signing up for a CSA. So when you're thinking about how to market your product to your ideal consumer, think about what's convenient and where is that price point and how does that relate to that ideal consumer? Are there ways that you can partner with others for that to be an affordable product for them? With that, I'm just going to say I I'm glad that you joined me today. I'm happy to take any questions. If you'd like to contact me about any of the information I shared today or other resources that are avail available to you, here is my contact information, my office phone, and my email. And with that, are there any questions? Hey, Colette, while we're waiting for um, some last questions to come in, I did have one that I wanted to ask. Do you have any tips for making that first contact with a retailer or a restaurant? Is it better to call, to go in person? How would you go about starting that relationship? That's a really good question. And I think it really depends on the entity that you're trying to reach. If you are going to um, walk in, if you're going into a restaurant, you're going to want to make sure that you don't go there at the busiest time. My guess is that you might want to actually walk into a restaurant because they are so busy and to leave your card if you can't talk to the, you know, head chef or the manager and to ask, what's the best way for me to follow up? And if you do go in, bring a sample, you know, that's the way for people are going to remember you. I'd like to, you know, meet with your chef. I'd like to meet with the owner or the manager. And here's a sample of the type of products that I would be interested to talk about out with you. In terms of working with a grocer, you could often call a grocery store or a re retailer and ask to talk to the store manager or the produce manager and then to schedule a time to meet with them. They're probably going to be a little bit busy if you just drop in on, you know, on a specific day and ask to meet with them. But if you do that, again, have your business card, some information about your products, perhaps a sample, and ask to schedule another time to sit down and talk with them. If you do make those calls or those, you know, in-person connections, don't expect that you can necessarily talk at that moment. Plan it as a follow-up. Great. I don't have any other questions at this time. Okay, thanks. Just a reminder, here's where you can find the uh, next in our webinar series and you can find links to our recorded webinars and other programs in Cultivating Success. Tomorrow we actually have another webinar and it's on Quicken versus QuickBooks Record Keeping 101 for the small farm. So if you're thinking about financial record keeping, this could be a great opportunity for you to see what some of the differences are between these two programs that are widely used by farmers. And then beginning in March, we're going to have a whole series called Financial Fitness for Farmers that's really going to introduce you into more business planning and record keeping for your farm. So you can sign up for those webinars here at cultivatingsuccess.org slash webinar series like to ask you if you could please take a couple minutes to complete a post webinar survey. These are really helpful to us as we plan our surveys or plan our webinar series and identify what topics we are going to offer in the future. So this takes about three minutes to do. It's going to automatically pop up in your browser and we hope that you can take a couple seconds to complete it. With that, thank you for joining me today and I hope that you have a great rest of your week.